Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right, so it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Cameron uh, Patterson, coming from uh, University of Manchester. He's going to give a talk to us about Finisher, which is the attempt to simulate a billion neurons, and they're building hardware to do it. So this is a hard thing. I'll take it away. Thanks very much. Um, I've just started a postdoc post position in the, uh, in the same department. Um, first of all, tell you what Spinnaker actually is. You can see there's some capitalization there on the, on the letters. So uh, uh, it's a contraction of spiking neural network architecture, um, although I'm not quite sure where the K comes from, but uh, that's how it's said anyway. Um, but just as a broader overview, it's part of a bigger uh, program which is run with four different institutions, uh, academic institutions within the UK. So there's Manchester itself, University of Cambridge, Sheffield, and Southampton. Um, and we're all working on biologically inspired multiprocessor architectures. So for example, Cambridge are looking at FPGA type activities and simulating large numbers of neurons within a, a big cluster of FPGAs that they've built into something called the Blue Hive. Um, whereas we've been working on for a number of years, uh, Spinnaker, and we've got around about one year to go on that program grant. Um, so, as the title says, we're, lo we're looking at putting together a million ARM cores in order to do some simulation of neural networks, spiking neural networks. So uh, we'll get going on that. If you need to get in contact or ask any questions, anything that comes to mind, then uh, give us a shout on the email address below. And there's also some further details about the project itself that I'll show towards the end of the presentation. So this is what the talk will uh, be about. It should probably take 40, 45 minutes or so. Um, if you've got any questions, just uh, maybe fire up now or, or we can talk about them at the end. Um, but firstly, I'll go through some of the motivations and some of the inspiration behind uh, Spinnaker itself um, and then talk about how we fit it together. Um, we'll look at some of the machines we've constructed with us with our actual silicon. We're quite different to a number of different teams and groups uh, that are working in the neuromorphic and in the, the neural modeling space because we actually have hardware and uh, we've had hardware now for a, a year in its current incarnation with 18, 20 cores. And uh, before that, with a test chip, we had that for another year in advance of that. I'll also talk about some of the software challenges because we're using ARM cores as our processors. So obviously, um, we're, we need to uh, look into the software structure and, and how we create our, uh, our neural network models in order to uh, build those large, large systems, those billion core systems, those billion neuron systems that, uh, that we were talking about at the beginning. Um, our state of the nation, so what we have right now, um, and then moving forward, how we hope to take that forward, and uh, that will round up in our conclusions and futures too. So um, the, the motivation, I guess, behind uh, putting together a multi-protocol, oh, sorry, a multi-protocol, multi, -protocol, multi uh, multiprocessor architecture comes from the fact that we see parallelism everywhere. So that's uh, in your cell phone, um, your desktops, your laptops, and uh, probably your refrigerator soon before we know it. Um, so that kind of begins our, uh, our approach. And if we think about parallel computers, probably the best example of a parallel computer, the best computing engine that we know is uh, the mammalian brain, the human brain. So uh, that begins our motivation, or that, again, is a catalyst for our motivation as well. Um, this hasn't gone unnoticed. Parallel computing is ubiquitous, and the human brain is pretty good at parallel computing. And there are a number of different grand challenges throughout the world, which are to look into the architecture of the brain and mind, which is what the UK grand challenge is all about. But there are also similar architecture, so similar initiatives, which are uh, all throughout the world. So this is our approach to it. Um, and I guess the question is, can we learn from the way that the brain is put together, the way that it operates? And uh, for us, our group in Manchester and, uh, and our wider collaborators, we're processor technology groups. So what can we do within this particular space? So 
I said there that the brain is probably the best parallel computing engine that we know. It's good at some things, maybe not as other, at others. But if we start to break, these, break it down into its individual components, its individual cells, um, we've got around about 100 billion neurons. This depends on each, which study you look at. So we take a cross-section of the cortex of a, of a human and uh, work out how many neurons that we have within that particular section and then multiply out the numbers. So this number tends to change a bit, but it's in the order of these sort of, uh, these sort of figures. And similarly, if we look at the connectivity which connects together these fundamental computing elements, there's uh, around about 1,000 if you look at as gross average connections between one neuron and then its downstream neighbors. So one neuron connects in a fan to 1,000 other neurons uh, that are downstream. Um, we're pretty, sorry, yeah? Yeah. Okay. We'll go for 1,000, though, so ignore my number there. Um, so around about 1,000 is, is, is a generally accepted number of neurons which each um, upstream uh, passes on to, passes its signals on to. Um, the brain itself is uh, pretty good at power efficiency, so we're not boiling eggs on people's heads. There's probably around about 20 watts worth of uh, heat or power coming out of, your, uh, out of your head. So it's pretty power efficient for what it's able to achieve and the number of cells and the amount of computation which is going on. Um, each of these cells isn't particularly quick. So each individual neuron can send an output signal, perhaps in the order of around about 100 hertz. Again, it, differs, it differs with the, with the different cells and the different components, but certainly into the 10,000 is maybe probably the, the maximum number of events, messages, spikes that you could expect to see on the egress of a particular neuron. So it's not particularly quick in the number of events that, uh, that, that, it can, that each element looks after. And also um, the traffic as it passes to its downstream neighbors doesn't pass particularly quickly. So that the signals propagate in the order of meters per second. 120 meters per second is the, uh, is the fastest that I've seen in the, in the literature. So these signals aren't passing around the brain very, very quickly, although they're quite close together, most of these connections. Um, and each neuron isn't doing things particularly quickly. And that gives us some opportunities, I think. The other thing that we notice within our brains is that we're pretty adaptable. So again, depending on, on whose study you read, we lose a neuron every second and I'm standing here, probably a few more if you're down in the bar. But uh, even if you lose one neuron, two neuron, three neuron, we're not actually uh, on a downward spiral. We can generally adapt. So there's probably fault tolerance in there. There's probably some adaptivity which allows us to learn and to make new pathways, which mean that if we have an individual cell which dies, we can get around that. And of course, we can do some autonomous learning. So a very, very quick overview of, uh, of, 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 a, of a neuron, this individual computational element and how it connects. This is very simplified because I couldn't possibly fit a thousand neurons, a thousand downstream neurons on the same slide. So this is our neuron here. It has a number of dendrites in the order of a thousand connections. Again, a gross average. This, this depends on, on where the neuron is, what job it has. So we maybe have a thousand inputs coming into this, coming into this neuron. The inputs are then integrated, and then if a threshold is passed, our cell membrane uh, passes a particular threshold. A spike is then emitted, which travels along the axon, and then is distributed out to the downstream neurons uh, in this fashion here. So that, say again, if we're doing averages, say around about a thousand. Um, to pass on to the next neuron down the line, the electrical signal passes, passes to a synapse, which is an electrochemical, uh, generally an electrochemical um, situation. So I've, I've spun one out here. Um, so we have a spike, which is a binary event. So once this reaches its threshold, the spike comes down here as an, an electrical signal. That stimulates the chemical balance of this synapse and neurotransmitters pass from one side to the other, and then that signal passes down to the next neuron within the chain. So that we kind of talk, uh, I thought it'd be useful to put that into this slide so that when we talk about some of the other connectivity issues and so the, that we deal with 
um, when it comes to simulating this, this biological structure, then uh, it gives it a little bit of context. So the grand challenge itself, it works in a number of ways, or you can think about it as working in two different ways. So if we study the brain and we simulate the brain by, by producing a, a copy of, or, or, of, of um, or so we build a mathematical model of uh, how those cells actually function within the, within the brain, we build, build this and simulate it, can we understand how it works? And what we can certainly do is we can push and prod these simulations as much as we want, whereas we can't do that particularly with uh, animal experiments and uh, experiments on humans, which is what actually in reality what we might want to do. So if we can build a good enough mathematical model, then we can do all of these experiments which might be unethical to do or impractical to do. We can run them with, with parameter sweeps, that sort of thing in a computing environment. And the end goal, I guess, is from a medical point of view, is that we end up with better treatment regimes. So we have different techniques to, uh, to, to, to look at those degenerative diseases that, that, that affect so many of us in later life now. Um, but also, in the other direction, can we learn some lessons from the, from the biology? After all, we are pretty good at doing particular things as humans. Um, our brains are pretty good parallel computers. So can we apply lessons learned as we learn more and more about the brain to parallel computing, um, particularly in terms of energy efficiency, because if we were to look to simulate the number of neurons within the brain, we'd be talking very large numbers of, uh, of very large quantities of, of power and energy that we'd have to supply to the system. Um, similarly, with the big supercomputers now, are starting to become limited by the power, not necessarily, and, and the infrastructure and the environments, rather than actually uh, sticking together a lot of cores. Um, and also the fault tolerance aspect. So if we have one core within a system that falls over at the moment, if your simulation or if your system isn't tolerant of that, then, um, then it, the whole thing falls over and you have to start again from scratch. So can we learn something from the brain about fault tolerance as well? So neural network simulations aren't particularly new. Uh, this slide here shows a couple of different approaches that we're taking. So, these are software packages you could load onto your PC and run on your PC. So Neuron's probably the best known of these. Uh, Neocortical Simulator, Nest, Brian, PC Sim. Have a look at the, um, the slides later, I guess, if you, if you want to dig out and have a play with these things if you haven't already. Um, and we can run these on general purpose bits of hardware. So that might be your workstation, your laptop, probably even your mobile phone nowadays. Uh, cluster machines, uh, GPGPUs as well. Um, so a general purpose uh, Activity so neuron simulation actually fits well into into a GPU type model, single instruction multi data type um, activities. But up until now, these things don't scale particularly well when you get to larger and larger models, and also high performance computing as well. So neuron is uh, within our particular area is used to do some of the larger simulations and better known simulations such as Blue Blue Brain, um, if you've heard of that one before. Um, the hardware, uh, other hardware approaches to take are programmable devices. So this is rather than using a uh, general purpose computing way of doing things, you can uh, download your, your models onto an FPGA or a field programmable analog array, which actually fits reasonably nicely into neuromorphic hardware, which is typically uh, application-specific circuits, VLSI circuits. Which are, which are based either in the analog domain or a mixed domain in digital as well. So these are chips which are specifically designed to do neural modeling. And obviously that brings with it, if you're designing these custom chips, all of the advantages of, of power efficiency and, and, uh, and density as well in these particular architectures. Where Spinnaker sits is within, uh, it sits between these two different models. So it's programmable as it's a general purpose computing uh, model and also it sits in the neuromorphic space because there are particular challenges around the communications with neural networks and we saw a, a glimpse of that earlier on when there were a thousand connections coming from each neuron. Well if you want to model a, a billion neurons then you multiply that by a thousand and you start to get to large numbers of communication paths that you need to model within your system. Um, sure. Thank you. 
allowed? Yeah, I don't think it's. Yeah, I don't think it's particularly found. It's uh, there's certainly no killer application for these. So there are expert systems, there are control systems as well to an extent, but nothing that really has taken over the world right now. Um, so various small scale implementations of things was there. It, it's difficult to know if you've succeeded um, because within a, an example I like to use is I tie my shoelaces every day. Um, but I probably tie my shoelaces in a, ve in a slightly different way every day as well. But it, it's, it's down to the general result rather than the um, individual components and the individual spiking messages that are passing around the system. So it's, it's, uh, you end up with a with a pattern of results which fits within your requirements. It's very difficult to, to, to know, I guess, exactly as you're saying there, whether or not you've got something right or wrong. So fitting into those, um, into those particular spaces that we were just mentioning there, actually, um, there's probably been three different generations of neural modeling throughout the years. First generation, uh, the threshold logic unit, which is effectively uh, inputs, binary inputs that come into this unit. You sum them together, and if it reaches a particular threshold, then you have a binary output, which is uh, well, one or a zero, or true or false, or however, however you want to, it to do that. And then that passes on to the downstream connections. Not particularly biologically faithful, but uh, still useful in some circumstances. Second generation is a, an extension of that where we're no longer limited to binary um, inputs and outputs. So uh, you've got a floating point range or something like that. Um, and depending upon your threshold, you have an activation uh, output. And that activation output can represent a spiking rate. So once information was once thought of, the number of spikes that come out of a neuron per second at that rate, it represents the information from those particular neurons. But the third generation now looks at the encoding of the, uh, of the time of the spikes which pass out of the system. And that's the third generation of neural network modeling. And that's spiking neural networks. And that's what Spinnaker is aiming at. However, saying that, uh, in the uh, psychological space in psychology, um, the multilayer perceptrons, second generation neural network models, are, are used predominantly um, for learning, for pattern matching, for but for um, activities such as that. And that's our first real customer of Spinnaker will be a group uh, in the psychology department who have got as far as they can get with their particular cluster implementation. And um, I just wanted to mention something there about the granularity of simulation. So you could go all the way down to the electrochemical simulation. You could model your neurotransmitters and... Uh, and uh, particular ions passing across channels. If you want to, you can go down to that level. But in, a programming mo uh, but in a programmable model, you can also abstract that to the very, very fundamental behaviors that take you away from that electrochemical model into something which is a lot more abstracted and you can do far more easily within a, com within a computing platform. And then in a programmable machine, that allows you to run very many more neurons within the same resources that you have available to it. Mm. Um, you can have some analog simulations where you, you would run in, in continuous time, but typically simulations are discrete. Um, so in our examples that, that, that I'll give here, we use one millisecond time uh, intervals between the evaluation of each of the neurons. Um, I'll maybe talk a little bit more about that in a second. Not often, no. It, it, as, a, as a general model, it seems, to, it seems to work well. Although, if we want to, we can run at a, a resolution which is, which is uh, a microsecond if we want. It's just a, a, an arbitrary choice that we're using. Very rarely, um, within, the, within certainly the, the research and things that I've seen, do, is a millisecond uh, too little granularity. Are you thinking of 
Yeah, so we do both. And as I say, the first customer that we have is psychology, which is after second generation modeling. It's not after spiking neural networks. Uh, that was a question that we came before. I think it. it uh, uh, for them, um, th it, within the multi-layer perceptron model, everything operates to to a synchronous beat. So um, they and they so you, you have two cycles what, where you have the feed forward where where things are uh, what the, the network flows all the way through, and then the second one where you do the back propagation and the recalcul and the calculation of errors, and then you modify your weights uh, accordingly to, to to fix your simulation. Okay. So if we have a look at Spinnaker itself, it's, um, well, we, we know that we need an awful lot of neurons if we're going to do anything of biological significance. A single neuron on its own doesn't actually mean very much. It's only when you collect them together into a large neural network that it does something useful. Uh, Spinnaker aims to do a billion plausible neurons, and that's within the one millisecond timestamp that I was talking about there and using this abstracted view of the neurons. But... It's programmable, so we can change the time step if we want to. We can change the model if we want to. Whereas if you fix your model in hardware, such as the neuromorphic space, then you can't actually change that model. You're, you're fixed. Um, so we also need an awful lot of bandwidth. And I've done some numbers just below. In the brain, you have discrete wiring. So your neuron has an axon, which we saw on screen earlier on, and then connections across uh, across to other neurons through the synapses and dendrites to it. Um, so in this instance here, if we have um, a, where are we, 10 to the 9, Eight to nine million. a billion neurons, um, each firing on average 10 times a second, and then passing that on to downstream another 1,000 synapses, then we end up with a trillion network events per second, a trillion messages which are arriving at the downstream neurons at any one particular time. So there's, uh, there's, there's quite a lot of messages to be passing around a system, even for a simulation only modeling a billion, which is one hundredth of what we have within our heads. And typically, certainly on many of the computing platforms that, that are used for neural network modeling, um, the, your limiting factor is your network and not necessarily your compute power. No. Yeah, there is the. Uh, I think by default you have quiescence. You don't have these uh, network events firing, so they're very sparsely. Um, as you say, they 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 don't fire, or so not all parts of the brain are active at any one particular time. If that were the case, then you'd have an epileptic fit. So that's the, the you have a broadcast storm going on where the messages don't mean mean so much. So activity shifts around the system dependent upon where the Stimulus and activity actually occurs. Yeah. Yeah. So typically, your neural networks are wired approximately to to yourself. So ninety percent of your connections are going to be very local to your uh, to your device. So whether or not that's on your chip or in the chip which is next to you. A very, very, uh, maybe 10% of connections go further afield. Uh, and that's the kind of architecture that we find here. And that we use that um, within the numbers that we use to, to work out how big network connectivity we need to build. Um, there, there will be proximity of, uh, of, of connections there. Um, where were we? OK, did I move forward randomly? or? Ah, there we go. Okay, so luckily, um, even though the biology is pretty slow, so meters per second and uh, number of uh, number of times that these things can spike per second is in the is in the thousands, then uh, we can actually do things a bit more quickly with the electronics and make use of the the inherent abilities of the electronics. So the communications are fast, and also the the processing is fast as well. Um, Spinnaker aims to uh, exploit that. And uh, we use the ARM processing set to define our software models and uh, in whichever way that, uh, that, 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 that whoever wants to make the models would like to create it. 
Um, the number you can do, obviously, you're, the more complex your model, the, 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 the smaller size the network that you can fit on the hardware. Um, so within the so that's within the ARM core. So we can do a certain number of modeling of neurons and synapses, but the communication aspect is uh, is done using packets, which are spread out across our packet switch network, um, and they use address event re representation, which means that each neuron is given an address, and then we use multicast routing to then spread that from a neuron out to its downstream neurons as well, and that's supported in hardware via our router. I'll show some pictures of this in a tick. Um, so the idea when we were building the machine was that we'd, we wouldn't use much power, so that's the, hence the reason behind the choice of the ARM chip, and also the reason why we have a fairly small amount of uh, memory which is available to each of the cores. Um, the intercommunication is all done asynchronously, so it's self-timed. If there's no traffic, if there's, th there's no spikes to send, uh, it, it, we're not burning power by running a clock. So each of the cores is a synchronous uh, component, uh, and there are various other synchronous components, but it's all interconnected, including on chip, via asynchronous technology. Um, and we're event driven, so if there's nothing happening, the processor is asleep. There's a little bit of redundancy. We've got a large number of cores per chip, or a reasonable number of cores per chip now, I guess. Um, and we also have multiple external links which connect the chips together. Um, and if one or other of these devices or these components fail, we can use something else. And our aim is to do real-time modeling of the system. So this is what a Spinnaker machine might look like. Each of these green blobs here, or red blobs, is a Spinnaker node. Uh, it, each of them have six connections, north, south, east, west, and northeast, and southwest. Um, and 18 ARM cores sit within them, which are programmable, as I mentioned. Uh, we can connect a system together in this Taurus configuration that, that can be up to uh, 65,000 chips. And then if you multiply that by 18, it gives you over a million processor, processors, and we end up with a quite large number of instructions per second. We look at a flattened version of a small Spinnaker machine. So this is a nine-chip machine. Um, so this is a Spinnaker chip within, so this, this sort of, can I use a rounded rectangle anymore or as Apple kind of done that? So that rounded rectangle there, that package is, uh, well, I should curve it a little bit, a bit more, but is the actual Spinnaker chip, uh, sorry, is the Spinnaker package. Inside that we have a Spinnaker chip and an SD RAM which is stacked on top of that connection as well. Um, we. Uh, like six different directions of connectivity and they're wrapped around to form the torus. So if we zoom in and have a look at one of the nodes, this is what it looks like inside. So we have our external links that we saw in the previous slide going off in the various directions. We also have two different knocks and they're asynchronous knocks developed by our project partner, Solistics. So um, there's no clock running these uh, within these knocks. Um, they're driven as they need to be uh, on demand by the, uh, as necessary. Um, so there's a router which sits within the comms knock, which takes care of 24 ports which are required. So we've got six external links and then 18 cores. So we have 24 full duplex ports um, in, in, into the router. So we have a merge tree that, uh, that feeds in and out as well there. Um, and everything that should pass around is a packet. So these are very, very small packets. The address event representation is quite small. We can have up to a billion neurons within our system, so we need 30 bits of information to give each of those an ID. So we use 32, it being an ARM architecture. Uh, the system knock itself gives access for the processors to the shared peripherals which are on each core. So we've got a RAM, a small RAM, which we use for uh, message passing between the cores. Uh, there's a ROM as well, which is used for booting it up. Um, optional Ethernet, so that doesn't have to be on every chip, but it provides our access to the outside world, as many of those as you, as you might want. Um, and the SDRAM interface to the on-package SDRAM, so that's stacked there. And we've got 18 processor nodes. So if we have a quick look at each of the processor nodes, this is where I was talking about these are really quite limited resources. So this ARM9 might run at around about 200 megahertz, so nothing more than that. So we have 18 ARM cores running at around about 200 megahertz and each of them only have 64 kilobytes of data memory. 
for, uh, for their use and 32K of instruction memory. So it's quite constrained. This looks a little bit like an embedded environment, but then stamped out maybe up to a million times. The ARM cores uh, we, we have from Project Partner ARM. Uh, they're synthesized versions which we just place into the uh, process that we use. Um, we only use fixed point. We don't have the floating point because it fits our particular requirements. And it also means that we don't have to run another piece of hardware that all, all the time. So again, the idea is to try and make this as an efficient a way as possible. Um, I mentioned those before. Uh, we have a custom DMA controller so that the memories which are off chip, which are multi-cycle, uh, latencies to access those memories, we can hand that off to the DMA controller and then come back later with an interrupt from the DMA controller which says that this DMA is, is finished, go on and do the next, or do something with it. Uh, JTAG there, if anybody's interested, we, we can build some quite long JTAG chains. So we have uh, 864 cores within a JTAG chain, so it's uh, quite extensive um, on, a, on a larger board. It, it doesn't. No, it's that they're all discrete connections. That's right. If you, if you can provide that um, that discrete wiring, but we can't provide uh, a, a hundred billion discrete connections. The way that we provide that is via a uh, is via a dressing and a routing. Um, no, it, that would be quite rare. That, and we do prov with this routing scheme, we provide any-to-any -any connectivity, so that there's flexibility. If that's what you want to do, you might want to test the uh, the, the facility and, and and really run things as um, unoptimized as you want to. It gives you that flexibility, but but also it gives you the flexibility to actually be efficient as well. So I could see where you could build a hierarchical. Uh, method of addressing your neurons as well, so you wouldn't need so many bits for connections which are close by, uh, for for your downstream neurons which are close by, and you could build something hierarchically. But I think when we're multiplexing and using packet a packet switch network, we have to give some addressing to the to the devices themselves. And there's some simplicity around the way that it's being done as well. That doesn't matter. It, it, everything is done in the same way. So this is a GDS plot of our hardware, uh, which has been labeled. So um, we have two different variants, a sort of left-handed and a right-handed version. So this is our, and they're stamped out 18 times on the, on the chip itself. This example here, so this is the ARM 968. Most of the space actually taken with those 64 and 32K of memory, which are for each uh, private to each core. And then also we have our network connections, which are happening to the uh, to uh, to the both the system knock and the and the comms knock, and we have some uh, uh, some custom logic which is built in these tracks down here. Uh, sorry, in these uh, in these avenues down here, um, and our knock is built around the router itself. So a little bit, few numbers about the the chip itself. It's around about 100 square millimeters, so 10 mil by 10 mil roughly. Um, it's built a, um, on a 130 nanometer UMC process, and we've got around about 100 million transistors per die. Most of those, of course, are, uh, are in the memories themselves. Um, and if we run at 180 megahertz, we dissipate just around about one watt, so not a huge amount of power um, going up in smoke. Um, each node can do around about four giga instructions per second. On the, um, I, I can, the encoding scheme or, or the packet types. So, it's, yeah. I, so, externally from chip to chip, we have um, two of seven encoding. So, two of the wires change. So, there's, there's that, that two of the wires. Um, alter per transition. So we've got quite a lot of wires going from chip to chip, so that's a, s a single unidirection. There's at least eight wires going from one chip to the next, and then in the opposite direction you have the same. 
we can achieve around about 250 megabits per second on each each of those links on those self-bound links uh, but the two of seven is the encoding type and then above that we have packet a uh, number of different packet types so we have multicast which is the, the ideal way of what we think of uh, of representing one neuron firing and then at that uh, fanning out to the other connections. We've got point to point so we can address any core within the system and a couple of other types which are used for diagnostic type activity. So uh, I, I don't know if that kind of an answers your question. There's a, the, the, it's a hardware router which is here. So um, even if all the cores are doing nothing or, or are switched off, the router can continue to function within the system. It's all done in hardware within there. Um, you have to set up the system. So yes, you, you can put a, that's the good thing about it being programmable, is that you, you send down your program to say, negotiate yourself an address with it within the system, um, build your routing tables uh, and that type of uh, activity. Yes, but the actual, so the routing tables are there just in that, in that RAM block there. Uh, it's, uh, it's a TCAM memory, so it can all, it, each entry can be all looked up at exactly the same time. So, um, uh, an SDRAM. So we, we have some SRAM here, shared RAM, there's 32K of that. But the SDRAM actually, I, was gonna, I should have showed you, this, showed you this earlier. This is this is a Spinnaker die. And then on top of that, we have stacked uh, our 128 megabytes of SDRAM. So again, not a huge amount when you share it out amongst the 18 cores, but enough to be able to do our primary purpose, which is neural network modeling. So this is, uh, this is, these are bonded together and then packaged up into a Spinnaker chip. We'll see a picture of that in a tick. So briefly discuss the um, processor technologies. Uh, oh, sorry, the process technology is used. So 130, as I was talking about before, we've got eight metal layers. If this is of interest to anybody, I don't know. Um, uh, we use two out of the three libraries in the fusion process, and those are chosen to give us uh, normal, normal performance. But if we have any slack within any particular area when we're building the chip, we use a low leakage library there. Um, and the reason for using 130 nanometers rather than sort of jumping down to, uh, I don't know, 22 nanometers or something like that, is that this technology is pretty mature. It's uh, competitively priced, which is pretty useful for us as a university. And the other thing is that the EDA tools that we have available to us, they're, they're not keen on giving away at an academic price the, uh, the cutting edge, the bleeding edge type activity. So that's, that's the process that worked well for us, for a, or, or that, uh, that fitted our requirements at the time. The, um, we could probably, if we were to use a modern process, and this is something that one of our PhD students is still doing, if we look at using a modern process, we could probably make order of magnitude savings in power if we moved to one of the newer technologies, uh, the newer, newer processes. But uh, that's what we have available to us at the moment. Um, and th this is saying that the asynchronous isn't particularly supported very well within the, within the EDA tools. So there was a lot of hand crafting, hand cranking going on to fit the asynchronous stuff onto the die itself. Um, I've kind of mentioned most of this stuff already, I think. So the, the SDRAM is a mobile version. Um, things go to sleep, um, and we use asynchronous activity. And all the way through, we've been looking at what we can do to gate off power supplies if they're not necessary, to try and reduce the, the amount of uh, dynamic power that we draw. Um, there are five different clocked areas, so cores, routers, different peripherals. Um, and we also have facilities to monitor what's going on within the machine. So um, we can, uh, looking at diagnostics, we have temperature sensors on board. We have um, the ability to look at counters uh, and, and make configuration changes within the system as well. And that allows us to draw some pictures, which I'll show you in a tick. Um, the redundancy I didn't mention there, actually we've kind of mentioned that before, is we've got two clocks, so if one fails within a particular die, we're fine. The redundancy is actually quite, interesting because we've got 18 cores. We typically use 16 of those for application type roles, so they're doing the neural network modeling. We use one for housekeeping, admin, um, IO type activity. So we have a spare core, but actually we use that spare core 
to increase our yield. So those chips that we get back, those dye that we get back that only have 17 functional processors, we actually press into service anyway. We don't throw that away because we're only expecting 17 of them to be working. If we have an 18th, then we can use that maybe for some utility purpose or have it spare so that it, uh, if, it break, or if one of them breaks down, um, then we can just remap onto all the functional processes. Um, so we've got various different error checking mechanisms, parity and CRC checking throughout the system. Um, and emergency routing for interchip communications failures, but it's not just communication failures, it's times when we have congestion. So there is the potential for congestion within the system. In this example here between 1.1 one, one and 2.1, if this were either temporarily congested or permanently disabled, we don't need to reconfigure routing tables. Uh, the chip will automatically detect that the, uh, this output is backed up and send it anti-clockwise. And then this chip will realize that this is an emergency routed packet and will then send it clockwise and it ends up at, the, at this direction. So this is a justification as well for using six links rather than four. If we only had four <laughs> links, we would have to go around the uh, three sides of the square. So some pictures of some machines. Oh, sorry, yeah. Is there a risk that congestion will uh, uh, destroy your simulation? Um, yes, if it got extreme. Um, typically, the, or the amount of time that it takes for a packet to get, even if this is from one end of the machine to the other end, is, is very, very small compared to the biological timescales that we are actually uh, rep, uh, we're, we're emulating. So microseconds versus milliseconds. Um, so even if, it, even if it's delayed for a, for a particular time as it goes across the system, the delay within, within as it passes across the packet switch network is never going to be the same delay as we're replicating in the software model because we're, we're modeling meters per second, whereas this thing goes much, much quicker. That answers that. So this is what a machine looks like. So this is, uh, this is our test board that when we first got our spinnaker chips back, uh, we connect four of them onto a fairly small board. So this is probably around about four by four inches. You get an idea there on the, uh, the size of the Ethernet connector, how big this is um, or how small it is. So this thing draws not very much power, five or six watts, that's it. Um, we've, in the last month, had our new boards back. So you can see we're uh, slightly bigger this time. And these are the boards which we're going to use modularly uh, in the larger machines to connect these together. So we've got 48 spinnaker chips. You can see it's all that there's, uh, there's no heat sinks on any of these because they're only emitting around about one watt each. So um, we don't have heat sinks or, or anything else. Uh, they're just passively cooled um, within, the, within this board itself but maybe 50, 60 watts um, that this board will actually pump out. The interconnectivity between boards, um, I remember I was talking about this, that there's quite a lot of wires involved in each of the connections between the chips. So when we're connecting this to the next board, there's quite a lot of different connections which would have to be made and replicated number of wires. So it would be a real rat's nest if we started to connect together each of these uh, boards or across the kind of edge connections around here. So what we, we've taken in, or we've, we've taken to using, are FPGAs. So one side of, your, of the connection connects into the FPGAs. We aggregate that back into a fast serial connection again. So it takes it out of the, anal uh, out of the asynchronous domain, unfortunately. But, um, but it provides us with the density that we need in order to connect these boards together. It's a SATA connection, yeah. So three gig per second, roughly. So this is a topo topological view of it. So actually what, oops, there we go, sorry. I knew I'd press that button. <laughs> I was wondering when it was going to happen. Um, so this is the 48 node board. It's actually connected together in kind of a skewed uh, hexagon. Uh, and that's what, that's what it looks like. Two sides of the hexagon are handled by each of the FPGAs and then onward connections to the next board. And the topology as we connect together these uh, skewed, distorted hexagons begins to look like that. So machines, so this is the boss's slide. He tends to put animals on the, uh, on the pictures to give us some sort of idea of how many neurons this, this counts for. Although whether or not you can compare what we do with an individual neuron with 
the functionality that you'll find in an actual animal itself. I don't know. But in terms of number of neurons, we're talking these orders of magnitudes. For the 103 machine, we're 10 to the power of the third digit, and that's how we kind of, or the closest anyway, uh, the closest uh, power of, and that's how we're numbering our machines. So uh, it's around about 1,000 cores, a bit fewer than that, 48. Um, around about 75 watts of power that draws. That's not a mouse, that's a bee, apparently. A mouse is the 104 machine. So um, one, r one rack, so that's a, uh, a rack of 12 of these spinnaker boards connected together. That's around about 10,000 cores, maybe getting up towards a kilowatt of power it will draw. And then our next scale, and that's the machine that we're delivering to our psychology um, partners. Uh, the next scale of machine goes up one scale of mag uh, one order of magnitude again, um, takes up one rack cabinet, and then the full machine with a million cores is probably going to be around about 10 cabs, um, uh, 90 kilowatts. And that's the number of neurons that you might find within a common or garden domestic cat. So you assume that the Yeah, but, but, but we have 18 cores in each of the chips. So the, 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 the chip, the package, generates around about one watt rather than the processor. So there are some overheads, obviously, from running the FPGAs, power conversions, uh, comms, that, sort of, that side of things as well. <laughs> um, so each of, the, each of the cores has within it a, uh, a boot ROM, so which bootstraps it, so, and that turns it into listening mode. So this is uh, one of the things that I wrote. It's, it comes up in listening mode, and it's listening. If it has an Ethernet connection, it's listening for a, uh, a, an image to be loaded to it across its Ethernet connection. Or if it's not connected to an Ethernet, then it's connected to six of its neighbors as well, listening for images on, these, uh, on each of its connections all, all the time. And then you, it's a staged level of boot. So bootstrap it, then you boot the next stage, and then you start to fill up your memory with whatever else you need to fill up your memory with. It's probably not even that fancy. It's, pr it's pretty simple, but um, we start to introduce more complexity um, and, uh, uh, as, as we go through those stages of boot. Okay. So I'll quickly go through the, the software stuff. I know we're kind of running short on time already. Um, so we're primarily modeling um, neural networks, artificial neural networks, but we actually do some other things on there. So this is an HPC or it will be an HPC when we have the big machines, but it's not going to be an HPC which is suited to absolutely everything. Those small messages which are passed around amongst the system are ideally suited to some things, but certainly not to others. Um, but we're playing around in these areas as well as neural networks themselves. And the, the, the real problem comes down to mapping, uh, well, the real issue comes down to mapping the problem down onto the machine and to the and to the hardware that you have available to it. So it's about the problem space or the graph and getting that down to the machine. And this problem becomes non-trivial once we start to get even to that 48-chip board because we've got so many resources that we, that we have. So each of those 48 chips has, eight, has 16 processors, and then you can run 1,000 neurons on top of that as well, and you've got the connectivity that connects all that together. So there's, uh, there's some issues around doing that. Um, I'll maybe actually just split, uh, skip this bit other than saying that we, we developed a tool called Pac-Man, which is for doing that mapping job, which is from taking your high-level description of your neural network or your uh, whatever it might be. It doesn't have to be a neural network, and then putting it into some sort of common form, which is used to split the load across the resources which we have available to it. You take in your constraints um, and use that to place and route so it's a place and route type problem as well. Um, coming out the bottom of that, you obviously have what you need to load to the individual systems. Um, we kind of mentioned that before. Um, and we use DRAM, oh, sorry, we use DMA to transfer data in and out of the SDRAM. So this is like paging information in and out um, as required. So you receive a message in from one of your neuron, uh, one of your upstream neurons. That then triggers the retrieval of the table which you need to be able to calculate that data. It's too big to hold within 64K because you have a 1,000 neurons on each chip. So you page in 
your synaptic table for those for that particular neuron, and then you uh, you do your calculations, store it back out if necessary with DMA, um, and 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 then yeah, do it for the next one, do it for the next one, do it for the next one. Um, spikes are encoded as packets as we've seen using multicast. Um, so what do we actually run on the cores themselves? So we have a thin API which we which we run, which gives access to the hardware, to many of the different resources that I was talking about there before, but a really, really thin layer. And then on top of that, you build your functionality that's required by your particular application. And so and they, these are all event-driven type activities. So both neural networks, packet received, as I just described this, packet received, you have a DMA event uh, and a timer event, which might work, which is your round robin for looking after each of your thousand neurons and updating your neurons and its potential within that particular time frame. But our timers can be squished down to millisecond if you want to do millisecond or, sorry, microsecond, and you, you, could, you can expand and change the system as you want. It's fairly adaptable. Um, this was a mapping issue, but again, I think we'll, we'll kind of skip through it. It's shown that you take, take constraint, you split your problem, you take your constraints into account, and then you use that to split it across the system and build your routing table as well to match. So that's what Pac-Man does in a nutshell. Um, and an example of how this fits together, so this is a neural network uh, model here. So you have your neural data which comes in from your high-level description of your network. So you have a number of different populations which are connected in a particular strategy. You take that in to Pac-Man, which does the uh, mapping and compilation, placing and routing. Your neural application, which you write on top of the API, and you load both of the output from your Pac-Man and your uh, application code to the machine itself and model your simulation, clearly. Um, you can interact as well in real time with your model and then you can also retrieve the data back, and this is the type of data that you get back from a neural network. Can you do that as well for some? I'm sorry? Yeah, so clearly if you start to look at the output for a billion neurons, um, or for even a large number of neurons, the amount of data that you can send to and retrieve from the system gets immense. So yes, you would you would either aggregate your data into something uh, which, which shows things at a, f at a population level rather than individually one by one by one, so you can reduce the amount of data that way, or, um, or you can look at individual neurons which you think are important. But it's this one's here? Yeah. So th th these are probably, it's not my slide, this one, I took it, I'm sorry. Um, it may well be something like a either a, a spike rate, so a number of spikes per second from a population, or it could be the membrane potential voltage over time. So you can, you can monitor a variety of different things or record a number of different things, bring them back from the system, and then plot them afterwards. So it's fairly generic what you can plot back. You're only limited by the amount of memory that you have to store it or your bandwidth to the outside world to send it to the outside world. And that's what this is. So this is some of the stuff that I've been working on. I included this one because it's a pretty picture. But it's a, it's a non-neural network simulation, which is running across a number of different cores, and it's doing a heat um, diffusion equation. So each core is a separate point within this particular, uh, this particular surface. You apply a different temperature along each of the sides, which you can interact with on this, on, on this interface down here. And then that will change in real time and move in real time. So it's just a way of visualizing the data that you get from the system and aggregating that data in the outside world. This one, this one here, um, this is data from all of the cores. This is the generation three board. It's a 64 core machine. So you maybe see it down there a bit more. I've, I've, I've interpolated that, sorry. So that, that, that's what this looks like. And, and you can change that, and it modifies and flows in real time. So it's quite, it's quite a, a, a pretty demo to look at. Yeah. On the 48 chip board, we've got a couple of Ethernet ports. Yeah. But it's not the only path that we have. Once we put the FPGAs in, we've also got extra SATA connections that we can then use to interface with a PC and we now have a three gigabit per second connection into the Spinnaker mesh. 
So Ethernet we've worked out isn't particularly effective for this type of activity. We could use it for connecting retinas and for, for other type activities as well. Um, this is looking at each individual call. So we have one call which is doing the monitoring of the system um, and a synthetic application that I've written which gives each call a slightly more um, load than another. So this is call one, this is call 16 and a synthetic amount of load which you've put on the system. But you can use this to detect hotspots as it goes through the system. This kind of modulates and, and, and flows in real time. It's uh, one call which is doing the aggregation for all of this data for this particular machine. Um, and this is a neural network here. So we've got 16 different populations of neurons, maybe 100 neurons in each of them, and a, an overall firing rate for that population. But we can then use this visualization tool to interact with it, so to give it more stimulus, to reduce the stimulus. And that's exactly what I've done there. By zooming in to this population, you can look at, in fact, there's 256 neurons in each of them, and you can look at the activity. Uh, as you play with the stimulation which is going on to there. So what do we have today? Well, you've seen, you've seen the chips on the 48 chip board. Um, we've got a number of different neural models which are running, synaptic models as well, and uh, various different types of neural uh, interface to the machine. So standard tools which you can run either on your PC, or now we have interfaces from Pine and uh, the neural engineering framework to Spinnaker itself. We got various other bits and pieces of tools, visualization that I showed you there. And there's our time scales for the larger machines. So we've, we've got our racks and we're, we've got about a dozen boards now. So we're working on putting together the 104 machine, 105 machine, and et cetera, by the time our grant runs out in September next year. So we have a Spinnaker multi-protocol multi system on chip. And we've aimed at doing all of those things and um, our Spinnaker machine hopefully will provide a programmable platform to do some very large neural simulations and uh, try and understand from a point of view of who might want to operate this, so your psychologists, neuroscientists, give them um, some utility so that they can go ahead and build the networks as they see fit. And, uh, but we can also do some other parallel applications, but it might not be suitable for absolutely everything. That's our group, and that's a question mark. So um, yeah, just to sort of say that before questions, there's some information on our website and also a nice uh, animated version of our Spinnaker um, Taurus floating in real time. And if you want to search the web, obviously via Bing um, or, or YouTube, if Microsoft have a video service, I don't know. Um, if you have a look for Spinnaker Manchester or Spinnaker Chip on both um, both of those sort of uh, mechanisms, you can, you can see some more examples of what we've actually done, robots following a line. Actually, before, don't. Uh, so, you know, you're, you're presenting a power efficiency argument, but I just want to really back that up. I'm just having a sense of if I gave you some relatively sized space and you know, maybe have cross purpose and based on effort and things like that, in order to patch it, yep. what does that do in the kind of war? Um, so we haven't really benchmarked so much for energy efficiency um, at, at, at this stage. We can, we can obviously look at the numbers. We know that it's 75 watts, and we have a certain number of tera instructions per second per board. So we can give you a, an idea in terms of giga instructions per second or number of joules per operation, um, that type of activity. And we have looked at some of our neural models as well, and we benchmarked the number of, of nanojoules per synaptic update. Um, I can point you at that particular paper which does that. But this is all fairly early days in, uh, in, in what we're actually implementing. Um, so many of the questions like, tell me about some of your neural models. Well, we only have a small number of these things. I think this part of the project is about enabling the, the hardware, so giving the foundations that people can then go off and run their neural network simulations on. But we've got to do it quick because general purpose computing will catch us up. We have this thing in hardware. We've had it for a year now. If we have it for another year, then we, we lose out on the, uh, on the clusters and the, the high-performance machines elsewhere. So we've got to make use. 
got to make hay while the sun shines. The, the, the issue is that not every signal might not. The, the, this is a non-deterministic machine, which is uh, a fairly scary concept to every computer scientist, I guess. But um, that's the way that the brain works. Not every signal will get through. And that makes it difficult to then compare to some other, uh, to some other project because you, because you might get a different result the next time that you run something. And so to do a benchmark... That's what we were saying. How do, how do you verify that, it, that, that it's correct? As it's, it's actually particularly difficult with neural networks. But if we wanted to, we can insert some, some synchronization type activities into the system. But that then slows down, our, that slows down how fast we can actually operate in the system. And then we can operate in deterministic mode, which we have to do, actually, sorry, for the, for the MLP machine. How fa okay, so your non-determinism comes from you have to load each core and each chip individually, and then you have to give it a signal to get started. Um, so the clocks are incoherent with one another. Um, that m how quickly it takes that message, or where you initiate that message from in the system, to say to when you coordinate everything, and then you, you load the machine, and then you send a message out which says, go. So there'll be some, be some non-determinism there because you can send that message into somewhere else within the network or maybe to multiple places at the same time. So there's, there is some non-determinism in from, from that point of view. And uh, I, I, I guess the mapping problem, is assuming you have the same machine every time with the same resources which are working and not, you should end up with the same map. Uh, of the same mapping down onto the machine itself, so th there maybe won't be the non-determinism that way. It's it's a sticky problem that, that we come across all the time, uh, particularly when we look at results, because we we can show a kind of a pattern, but we're not going to show exactly the same result every time within the system, and we can't compare it exactly with something else. So so trying to sell this as a tool actually is quite difficult. Because, I w yeah, of course, it's, 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 it's natural to say, I want to compare this. How does it work compared to this? And on some respects, we're not able to do that. <laughs>